We're in a, in a different kind of series right now. We started with the book of Ruth, and we worked our way through that, and we're actually jumping to the book of Jonah, and there's one more uh, short kind of overview of a book of the Old Testament coming next. But uh, this is a series kind of coming together as God is faithful, and we're going to talk about that. But um, we're going to talk today about the book of Jonah. We're going to open up to it. If I say Jonah, you say, well, oh, so it's good church people. All right. And if you're not a church person, you're like, whale, why a whale? Because it's the red herring of the book. It distracts you from the actual message. It's Jonah and the whale's a big deal. But don't get, let's take the whale and meh, kick it away. That's the sound they make when they're out of the water. And you kick them. If you're from PETA, I apologize. Um, but let's get rid of the whale, kind of push it off to the side. And let's focus in on the indictment that Jonah brings against God and the reality of what's going on in Jonah's life that he doesn't want to deal with. We're going to talk today about uh, in the very early chapters of the book of Jonah and really begin to unpack something that I think will be unsettling for you as much as it has been for me. And we'll live into it a little bit and kind of understand um, there's a reason Jonah ran away. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in West Michigan, when the sun comes out, or probably anywhere in Michigan, when the sun comes out, it's like everybody comes out of their houses. They're like, is it back? And there's that big ball of sun. They're like, it's not frozen anymore. And we're like little hobbits. We come out, and people are like, you know what? This is the year. I'm a jogger. And they take off running, right? I'm going to run. And we try to get rid of the winter coat, and it's awesome. But um, what, what you see is you see, you know, see adults out running, and they look so normal and natural at it, and it seems good. But have you ever seen an adult run from something? Like there's jogging, and then there's jogging when there's a bear behind you, right? That's a different run. You're like, ah! you just take off running. Jonah ran. Jonah ran from God. Kind of like running with the bulls, who, you know, it's not called walking with the bulls for a season because Guillermo's like, no, I'm going to walk. And they're like, we should probably run. He was gored. Like, you run from something when it's chasing you. It's dangerous. There's an element of, if an adult's going to run for something, they're probably about to become dinner, Right? That's when we run anymore. We're like, no, I'll take an Uber. But when you run, there's a reason. Jonah is a grown man. He's a prophet, and he runs from God. He literally hikes the robe up and gets his giddy up on it, just runs. And we're going to talk about it today. We're going to read the first three verses of Jonah chapter 1, 1 to 3, and we're going to unpack some other texts in Scripture uh, in the Gospels and a few other places. So when I reference that, that's where we're going, but we're going to spend the majority of our time looking at this. Um, I'll pop the slide up, and then you can uh, follow along as, as I read. Oh, yeah, A Man Who Flees. That's the title. All right, so uh, read with me. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from God, and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Notice this. The Lord came to Joseph and said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Preach against the city. Say something. Have you ever been like... Go yell at them. God, God doesn't seem to have a real positive word for Nineveh at this point. But Jonah takes off. He books it the other direction. And you've got to ask yourself, why? Was he a dyslexic prophet? God said, go to Nineveh, and he went the other way. What did he do? Why did he run the exact opposite direction? What's going on in this that makes Jonah uncomfortable to the point that he's going to flee against the word of the Lord. So we have to ask a question. Why not warn them? Why wouldn't Jonah warn them? And so we're going to unpack. If you like history, this will be your part of the sermon. We're going to unpack why Jonah would not warn the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and Jonah hated them. Jonah hated them with a special kind of passion. Why? Because Nineveh was ruthless. Nineveh was the first country to conquer kind of out towards the, the um, western or eastern edges of, um, western edges of Asia, up onto the Asian steppe there, all the way down into the Middle East and across into the Mediterranean. They were ruthless. Uh, Assyria, the, the nation, Nineveh, the capital, so it would have been the D.C., Washington, D.C. of, of 
Assyria would have been Nineveh. And one of the ways they knew they expressed their power is they would take the kings of the countries they had defeated and the warriors and the generals and they would mount them like kebabs on spikes and line the path to the city of Nineveh with the with the bodies of the generals and the armies who said, We will oppose you. And it gave a clear message. Oppose us and we will kill you. We will destroy you. We will lay waste to everything you have. One of the earliest reliefs we have, a portrait that, uh, an artwork that they have of the Nineveh, of the capital of Nineveh, is of the king, I believe, Sennacherib. And he would have been a contemporary to Jonah. And the, the relief is this. It's a picture of uh, King Sennacherib. And he's being fed grapes by an attractive woman. And then across the, the, the portrait is a head in a jar with its eyes ever open looking on at this woman feeding a great king grapes. And the head in the jar is wearing a crown. And the woman feeding the great king is his wife. Do you get why you would hate someone like that? The ever open eyes of a defeated king watching his wife not only be the subject but the new mistress of the king. They were brutal. They were ruthless. And they laid waste to the Middle East in their day. They were the greatest empire around. They were the first ones to conquer the horseback tribes of Asia. They were brutal. And in Jonah's day, they had wiped out the northern ten tribes, and they were besieging Jerusalem in the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And Jerusalem was besieged by Sennacherib. And in one of the early letters that we have, it says that uh, Sennacherib wrote to one of his um, uh, generals or somebody, I have King Hezekiah, the, is the Jewish king, pinned like a bird in a cage. He hated Assyria. He hated them. That's why he wouldn't warn them. The second thing, which I find absolutely fascinating, is he's a Jew. Jonah is a Jew, and he knew that God would forgive them. And the reason we know this is because if you jump ahead in the book of Jonah, when he's a little kind of downcast, and we'll talk about it in a couple of weeks, but he's kind of downcast and ticked off, and he gives this prayer. He says in Jonah 4.2, isn't this what I said when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who re relents from sending calamity. He's ticked because God is abounding in steadfast love, gracious, slow to anger, and he avoids sending calamity. He hates Nineveh so much that all he wants is for God to open up the box and push the smite button, and then poof, <laughs> you know, they win. That's how he would feel, but that's not what God does. Jonah hates them, and he won't take the word of the Lord and preach against them because he knows the character of the God he serves is a redemptive character. God seeks to redeem the lost, and Jonah wants no part of it because his enemies deserve the wrath of God, not the mercy of God. And I have enemies like that in my life, right? We don't like to talk that way in church, but aren't there people you're like, if I had a smite button, my friend, you would be a smudge upon the earth, right? Some of you laugh like, hey, hey, oh, oh, he tricked me. Yes, yeah, some of us have enemies, and Jonah doesn't warn his enemies for one very clear reason. He doesn't think they deserve the grace of God. And so we ask the question, as biblical people, we go back to the text and we say, how does Scripture interpret Scripture on this? How would, how would Jesus kind of interact with someone who doesn't deserve forgiveness? If we look at the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15, there's a story, a famous story, of the prodigal son that Jesus tells, of a son who is wayward and wild. He demands the family fortune and, or his portion of it, and he goes out and he spends all the family money. Basically, he goes to Las Vegas and blows the fortune and ends up, you know, like in desperate situation. He's lost everything. And it says when the son comes back, the father throws a party. The father throws a party. This lost, lame super arrogant and um, defiant, disrespectful son comes back. And the father's like, my son is back from the dead and he throws a party. But there's another brother who is a good son. And what does he do? What does the other brother do in this story? And I think this reflects well of the ethic of Jonah. There's a brother who stands in the field like this and the father comes and says, come to the party. And he goes, no. 
I never left you. I stayed with you. I worked my guts out on this farm. I have given you the best years of my life. I have made you proud as my father, and you never killed so much as a goat for me. But that loser comes back, and he gets the fatted calf. No, I don't want him to have mercy. Take care of him, Dad. I'm ticked, right? Isn't that amazing? Like, that's a paraphrase on what Jesus said, but that's the posture. It's this defiant, not for them. Not for them, why? Because I hate them. Because the brother who stayed home saw the father's broken heart. The brother who stayed home managed the estate while the father stood and looked down the road waiting for his son to come back. He was witness to the heartache and he was bitter about it. So we understand that even Jesus unpacks a theology that says we hate people. He understands that. And oftentimes when we don't reach out, it's because we know God will forgive. And we don't often like that. But God does. And God calls us to a spiritual and moral ethic of being transformed in this. So we have to ask a little bit of a different question that um, maybe takes it home for us. And it's this. What happens when we don't want our enemies forgiven. So I'm going to just ask a question, and I want honesty, okay? No lying in church. All right, who here has an enemy? You, it doesn't have to be like an arch nemesis, okay? But just somebody in your past that you're like, I would like them not to be forgiven. Anybody else? Like Jason, I love it. Jason's like, oh, I was waiting to do that. All right, so a few of us do. A few of us still want the smite button. You know, everybody, we have that. But we must ask, as Christians who love Jesus Christ, We must ask the question, what happens when we don't want our enemies to be forgiven? We must ask the question, we live into it. And the first thing is this, we recognize God's sovereignty. God can still reach those we hate without our help. But the graciousness of God invites us to the Great Commission to go into all the world and make him known and make disciples of all nations. God can still reach them. God is sovereign. You cannot control God just because you don't like someone, just because you don't give God permission to reach someone. You can't control him. God is not a chess piece that we can manipulate. God will seek the lost. He's invited us to partner with him in it. But just because you hate someone doesn't mean you can manipulate God and be like, look, I'll give you my whole life if you will just send them to hell. And we don't talk that way in church, but we live that way in our hearts sometimes. There's people beyond redemption in our own lives, in our minds, and God doesn't agree. God believes there is no one beyond redemption, and he sent his son to prove it. We are redeemed in Christ. So what we have to recognize is no matter how much you despise, dislike, or anything someone, it doesn't limit the grace and seeking mercy of God to find them. But it does in some way highlight our hearts. If you refuse to bring the gospel to someone you deeply hate or deeply dislike or have not forgiven, you are in effect saying by your actions that you don't believe God's love and redemption for them is their best. You believe you playing God is better than him being God. And it's an issue of the heart. But I will tell you this, I have that issue. There are people that I struggle with that I don't really want to bring the gospel to. I would much rather bring other things to them and light it on fire and then ring their doorbell and run away. Like, I, I, that, it's, what I, it's a terrible reference, but it's super true. I, can we at least be real about it? That there are people we do not want God to reach, but I want to tell you this. We don't get to control the sovereign God of the universe because we're emotionally upset or hurt or we've been abused by them. They're still redeemable in God's eyes, and he's called us to live into that. So we understand that reality is there, but we also get we suffer as Christians. We suffer because when we choose not to forgive or even want our enemies to be forgiven, we put distance between us and God. The best example of this is from my childhood. I remember we were growing up in the desert. There wasn't, it wasn't like Michigan. Everything wasn't green and soft, and there were rocks everywhere. So what did we have? We were boys, rock fights. And uh, we'd have rock fights. We'd pile up rocks. We're like, let's throw them in each other's faces, and we'd have a blast. And uh, my parents would say to us, we'd be leaving, and it'd be like, hey, no rock fights. And we're like, got it. 
And we'd go out and we're like, where do we want to have the rock fight? And we'd build our fortifications. We'd pile up stones. And it was, it was awesome. It was so fun. And until Jeff Duncan's poster board forehead got tattooed by my brother, he drilled it. It was awesome. I think he may still have a twitch. I mean, it just opened him up. Jeff was like, Bleh! and I'm like, so much. We are in super trouble. So what did I do? I went home around 3 in the afternoon. I'm like, Ugh, I am plum tuckered out, and I got in bed. <laughs> My mom's like, what have you done? Just, just a little bushwhack, Vaughn. I'm good. What happened? Jeff Duncan's head exploded. We're in so much trouble. I was trying to hide it from my mom. I tried to put distance there. Look at what Jonah did. He didn't like what God told him. So he ran the other way. God said, hey, go east. It's like if I said, hey, you want to meet me in Hutsville? You jumped in your car and you headed to the lake. I'd be like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just say, no, I don't want to be your friend and meet you in Hudsonville. But that's what Jonah did. Go to Nineveh. You got it. And he headed the other way. He headed the other way. He just took off the other direction. And we recognize that Jonah puts physical distance between him and God. Jonah was willing to drown, to die in the sea, rather than go and tell those people about God. Think about that. How much do you hate somebody? Have you ever said the words, I will be in my grave before I forgive that doorknob? I'm not forgiving them, right? This is Jonah's heart. And it put distance between him and God, not only physically, but spiritually, emotionally. It, it kind of ca- takes us captive and it wrecks us. And we are the victims of our own hatred. So what we recognize is that we too, like Jonah, have tried to put physical, spiritual distance between us and God when we're living in unforgiven, like we won't forgive and we won't be witnesses to Christ's redeeming love in our life. When we won't show the world who he is, it puts distance between us and God. When we don't want our enemies forgiven, there is a distance between us and God. It is painful, it is acute like a toothache, and it does not go away. Why? Why? Because there's a different ethic in Scripture. If you look at Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying a heavy burden. Have you ever hated somebody? Do you know how heavy that gets some days? You wake up and you're like, huh, you just grind on it. Why? Because you kind of hate them. It's a burden. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. When we talk about not wanting to have our enemies forgiven, we talk about shackling ourselves to an emotional boatload of baggage that doesn't own the people who've hurt us. It owns us. It breaks us. Most often, the people who have hurt us in life don't care, don't remember, and don't have any attachment to us. But we are bound to them by our hurt. And forgiveness gives us rest. When we come to Jesus, we meet the one who has forgiven so much of what we've done. How much has Jesus Christ forgiven of you? Because I don't want to tell you all the things he's forgiven me of. And I meet him when I come to him at his invitation, he gives me rest. And we recognize we get to live in one of two places. We can suffer because we've allowed distance, because of our unforgiveness between us and God, or we can come to him and meet him on his terms, not ours. So let's do this. Let's figure out how to apply this into our life in a few different ways here. First of all, Matt Chandler at the Village Church. I'm super glad they're not in Zealand because you would all go there. He's awesome. Um, But uh, they have this phrase, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Here's the deal. If you come in here and your life is a roaring dumpster fire of brokenness, welcome. You don't have to be perfect. I don't know when they perpetrated the lie that Christians have it together. We are a mess, and people should have been like, amen, amen. We are a mess, and it's not okay to stay there, but it's okay to come here and not be okay. But the reality is we can't stay in that broken place. We must move forward. We must learn to understand what God's called us to and who we are in him. There's these trigger points in us where we remember that it's not okay. I'm going to tell you a story of my childhood. I went to a, a school in Orchard Mesa, Colorado, uh, in Grand Junction there, Orchard Mesa Middle School. And uh, there's a teacher, Mr. Hurley. Um, if I talk about him too long, I, I think I hate him, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, you laugh, but I would like to, 
I want two minutes with him in a dark room and no cameras. I do not like Mr. Hurley. And I know you're like, pastors can't say that. It's the reality. He would bring me up in front of class. I'm, I'm dyslexic and I'm magical with numbers. And um, he would bring me up in front of class and give me a problem. And everybody would snicker while I did it. And I thought, one day, I'm going to be bigger than you. And I'm going to beat you till candy comes out. Like, I, I hated him when I was a little boy. I've never seen him since. I don't think he knows who Eric Folkers is, but Eric Folkers knows who Mr. Hurley is. And if I talk about him too much, there's this thing inside of me that's like, oh, just give me a piece of him. Like, I just have an, an honest rage. He hurt me. He shamed me. It took me years to believe I was smart. And he thought it was funny in his stupid, like, copper-colored corduroys. He wore cords. Like, makes me so mad. But the reality is, like, that dude, that hurt. I could carry that around. Like, today, I know I will have to not hate him in my life. I will have to forgive him because talking about him reminds me that it's not okay in my soul. I remember what he said, even if he doesn't. But here's the deal. I can't stay there. I can't live in that bitterness because guess what? I think Mr. Hurley was wrong. Not about everything. I think he was probably a good teacher and I was a nightmare of a student. I I trust. I, I earned some of what he gave me. But it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be broken. If you've been abused, if you've been hurt, if you've been neglected, if you have been in any way harmed, which if you're in this life you have, it's okay to not be okay. But here's the reality. It's not okay to stay there. We have to forgive and move forward. It's okay to be broken here, but it's also okay to start healing and allow this ethic to take place. Come to me, all you who are weary weary and carrying heavy burdens. That's our great hope. We come to the one who invited us to him. Jesus Christ invited us to him, not perfect, but broken, and he will give us rest. If you're not okay, that's who you turn to, to be okay. The Lord Jesus Christ. The next thing is this. We have to kind of take control of the situation. We have to own our role in this whole kind of story. Because I know this this reality is out there. If, If I say you're not okay and I say, where are you stuck at? You'd be like, oh man, I've got a Mr. Hurley. I have this person. I have that person in my past. I want to tell you something. We can't change the past. We can be stuck there, but we can't change it. We cannot change the past and we can't change how people act, but we can own our role. And the first step is this. We turn to the one who said, come to me. We we turn to Jesus and then we forgive. And this is the hardest part, to cut loose the abuses of someone over our life and say, no longer am I anchored to you by what you did. We cut the ties and we forgive. And I will tell you this, I said it a second ago, I will have to forgive Mr. Hurley again and again today. Why? Because I'm in front of a room of people and I talked about someone who put me in front of a room of people who all looked at me and they snickered and they laughed because Eric was dumb and it doesn't take me long to spiral on that. And I know my abuse to, to that guy, that's nothing compared to what some of you have gone through. It's nothing compared, so we need to own our role, and our role is this, forgiveness. We have to forgive again and again and again. We have to live into that identity, and we can control forgiveness. We cannot control them, our past, or the brokenness, but we can control one thing, what we do with what they've done. We we don't give them any power over us anymore, but we can forgive. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to no longer be bound to our past and hate people beyond redemption because there are no people beyond redemption. And we would believe it if we had learned to forgive. The only way I believe we can do this is if we live into the identity that our lives are meant to tell the gospel story by our brokenness and people seeing that we are real people who've been broken and hurt in this life, but we are also called people, called to serve the world that has hurt us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to be people who own our role, and our role is, first of all, go to Jesus Christ. And second of all, forgive those who've hurt you and cut yourself free from them. And then begin to live into a new identity. And the way we live into an identity in Christ is we understand, and this is critical, that we have healthy boundaries. People are terrible at life, and they will abuse you again. They will abuse you again. They will laugh at things that have wrecked you. Don't go back to them. Forgive them. 
Walk away from them, leave them in your past, and pursue your future and purpose in Christ. Have healthy boundaries. Have healthy boundaries. Don't turn back to people who will abuse you. Cut them loose, but move ahead with Jesus Christ. Go back to the one again and again who says, come to me. Come to me. Are you weary? Are you burdened? Come to me. I will give you rest. I will give you peace. How many times have you longed for peace in your life? Because there's so many people you just hate who've hurt you. It's time for them to be part of your past. And it's time for Christ to fill up the vista of your future. He is our goal. He is our identity, and he is our ethic. And our ethic is one of forgiveness, but also we don't give the world carte blanche to wound us again. Those who've hurt you get to stay in your past, but we, we get to live with him in our future. So for us, we set boundaries that protect us, but we also obey a God who will call us at some point to take the gospel to people we don't want saved. And that's tough. I'm going to say four letters to you, and this will bring it home quickly. ISIS. You're like, oh, yeah, drop a Moab on those dudes. Just boof. (laughs) Winner. That's how we feel. Drop a bomb and get rid of the terrorists, do all this. I want to tell you something. My daughter said something. uh, It just kind of blew my mind. We were talking after the Manchester bombing, and and we were talking about praying for the people and about the victims. And my daughter said, I pray for the, the people doing it, too, because God loves them. He wants them. What if we quit telling the world who we hate and we started showing the world who we love? I'm not saying that terror should run rampant. I'm not saying we shouldn't have security. Don't miss what I'm saying. I'm saying that there is no one beyond the redemptive power of the blood of Christ. And if we are going to be Christians in this day and age, it's gonna hurt because he will call us to be faithful In the easy places, sometimes like Zeeland, Michigan, and to the far ends of the earth or to the far emotional spectrums of our life. The people, sometimes the people who have hurt us are the people we will bring the gospel to. Is there anyone beyond the blood of Christ in your life? If there is, if there is, there's a problem. Because according to God, according to Jonah, according to the ethic of Scripture, there is no one beyond redemption. No matter how far a man or woman runs from God, there is nowhere that God won't find those whom he died to save. The question is, how now shall we live? Pray with me. Come, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, guard us, and guide us, we pray. Lord, it's not easy to um, ponder forgiving people who, oh, Lord, they, they are hard to even think about. Lord, it's not easy to ponder what it means that your gospel calls us to a life of turning the other cheek and and forgiving those who've wronged us. But we, we pray, God, that you would lead us to a place where our lives display redemption's glory, that we are people who forgive, and we are people who freely invite anyone to relationship with you. God, give us the courage. Give us the courage to be people who forgive well who set boundaries. But Lord, more than anything, may we hear your voice and that gentle whisper that says, come to me. Because I know, God, right now I'm in that place where I just want to come to you because there's so much conflicted emotion in my own mind right now because of who's hurt me. So Lord, I pray that the, that the reality would be far more than the noise of who's hurt us. May the whisper of him who calls us reach out. Lord, may we come to you because we are weary We are burdened with much, and we seek rest and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, please stand. Sing with me. We're going to end just a little bit differently this morning um, because we are people called to take the gospel forward. We don't live in a passive faith. We live in a dynamic, ever-moving, ever-changing faith. And I'm, um, I'm joined on stage by Austin Bonema. Austin just finished his junior year of high school, and he leaves next week. He'll tell you where he's going and what he's going to do. But I want to remind you that this faith is costly. When the gospel calls us forward, sometimes we send off our sons and our daughters to places far from where we call home to do what God's called them to do. And the question for Christians becomes, Will we be obedient? Will we be faithful to the call of God? Here's a young man whose parents 
at, I mean, this is your second summer going away, who are sending off their, their son. And, and I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to listen and ask the question, why not me? Austin, where are you going? Yeah, so uh, next week on, on Tuesday, I'll leave for Zambia, Africa. And then I'll stay there for about a month. And then I'll leave to Cambodia as well. What are you going to be, be doing? There in a month. So last summer, you guys sent me out to Zambia, and I was there for three months. And I, I spent that time training um, with other missionaries of how to communicate the gospel effectively, of how to sustain the gospel, and how to come out alive, and all that good stuff of being a missionary. And uh, now I'm going back to uh, lead expeditions. I'm an expedition leader. So we'll go out into the bush and with a group of like 20 people that are there for a couple of weeks and, and just go ham with the gospel for 10 days or so. And, um, you know, hut by hut through the day and the night meetings at night, we're praying for salvation, praying for healings, praying for deliverances. And then, um, then with the, the people that are coming to Christ, the people that are coming on fire for God, we, uh, we have people that come, come back and, and disciple them and start Bible studies and grow them so that they're going out and they're being missionaries. And then when the indigenous people are preaching the gospel, it makes our job pretty easy. Yeah. So, uh. I'm excited. Um, I'm thankful for, for what you guys have done and how the foundry has helped me spiritually and, and financially and, and given me that leadership in there. And I'm excited, and I can't wait to come back and, and tell you guys uh, some stories and, and hopefully get you guys going next year. Nice. Yeah. So here's what I, I want to push on this with you, and, and I mean it to be moderately offensive. What's your excuse? What's our excuse for not going? Because I can tell you, for Jacob and Kelly, this is their boy. And, and yeah, he's a towering man who has a better beard than me. But, um, but, he's, but he's, he's just finished his junior year. And it's hard to send your boy off to Africa without you. But they're doing it. And we make excuses all the time that I don't believe the gospel justifies. So we're going to pray for Austin. And I'm going to give you the benediction. Would you join me in prayer? God, we lift Austin before you and we ask, may your Holy Spirit fill this young man. Will you fill him, guard him, guide him, and direct him as he goes forward in ministry? Lord, may all that he does reflect you well. Thank you for Austin, for his leadership, for his friendship, and for the work you're doing in him, Lord. We pray you would protect him physically, that you would be with his mom and dad and his brothers and sister here at home, and that you would um, bring him home with not just crazy stories of what went on, but how your spirit led and drew people to you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we get ready to go, I'm going to invite you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't you leave here without doing so. Come see me afterwards. I would love to pray with you. Until then, my friends, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his Friends, in a world that knows so much chaos, may the peace of Christ reign in your lives. It is time for the church to leave the building. You are dismissed.